I am referring to the process of making cheese going all the way back to the beginning, starting with the land. For this presentation, I break this process down into three definitive aspects of making cheese. Um, the cheese, the goats, and the land. To present my initial observations on each of the variables of regulation, sense of place, and food value. A cross-cultural comparison between a goat cheese farmstead in Parma, Idaho, and a farmstead in Calabria, Italy, will analyze differences and provide insight into the cultural context in, in which artisanal cheese makers are attempting to make, distribute, and market their cheese. I chose Italy for a couple of reasons. From personal experience, Americans have an idea that Italy is the pinnacle of great food. In doing my initial literature review, this idea was backed up by descriptions of Italian food becoming a commodity fetish and romanticized in the U.S. By making this cross-cultural comparison of artisanal cheese making, the romanticism will be taken out of the equation and more comparisons can be drawn between the small scale production in each place. The research I am presenting today is um, some of my initial, fi initial findings of the farm here in, in um, Parma. So, we'll start with the cheese. Um, the owner of the farm puts a really big emphasis on food as an art. Um, she, she actually started out as an artist making pottery, and so this definitely translate, translates into her um, cheese making. Um, the second is um, changing the cheese in order to suit American tastes. She initially started the business um, wanting to do goat cheese, but she realized that she had to market this to the Velveeta consumer of the U.S., <laughs> and they are not used to European-style cheeses. And so she's definitely had to try and um, change according to that. And um, she says it's getting better now, but now she's stuck in, in these certain ty types of cheeses and she wants to try and break out of that and make more interesting cheeses. Um, she's also a very, um, a very big advocate for slow food and local food. Um, she says the problem with this is that the cost of making this kind of food is a lot more expensive, especially from the producer side of it, as well as the consumer side. Um, and she says this is, in her opinion, why small ag will never overtake the industrial agriculture because it's just too expensive and in reality it's hard for people to um, purchase this kind of food. Um, the stigma with small scale production is that regulations are really oppressive. In her opinion, that she did not find this the case. Um, she actually said that it's, it's fairly common sense and you just have to keep everything clean. However, she did talk about the pasteurization process and pasteurization is where you take the milk and you heat it up to a certain um, degree so that the bacteria is killed off, all bacteria, good and bad. And so she says that she can make the exact same style of cheese, do the process the exact same way, and the cheese won't taste as good as, say, in Europe because they have much less stringent regulation on raw milk. Um, and the majority of the, the cheese she makes is um, aged under 60 days, and according to U.S. regulations, you have to age it over 60 days for it to be raw milk. Um, the last thing that she talked about in terms of food value um, is definitely that she always strives for quality and perfection. Um, and she says that you can't buy outside milk, you absolutely can't, and have quality control. So this brings us to the topic of the goats. Um, she definitely, she does the whole process as a farmstead, which means she raises all the goats herself, they have the milk, and she makes the cheese from that milk. And so um, in order to make good cheese, you have to have, oops, <laughs> have to have good treatment and understanding of, of the animal. And she is incredibly proud of her goats, and not, not even just goats in general, but she thinks that these particular breed of goats are um, extremely intelligent. They're more docile than any of the other ones, and they produce the best kind of, of goat milk. And she says that it's because it's not the smelly kind that most Americans associate with, with goat milk. Um, the last thing that she talked about in terms of the goats is that they are foragers. She really hates penning them, but she has had to do that because of financial reasons and for safety reasons. But for the most part, her goats just forage for all of their food. Um, she says it's healthier and it makes better cheese, which brings us to the topic of the land. Um, because the goats forage for their food, it, the, um, the foliage changes with the seasons. Therefore, the milk and then the cheese also changes with those seasons. So she has a very high sense of place in that, in that respect. Um, so when she makes the cheeses um, in the different seasons, she pairs the flavoring that she adds to these cheeses according, according to those seasons. Um, as well, uh, she's, uh, on the other hand, she doesn't have any kind of grazing management to um, you know, make sure that the land is being treated okay, that the, the goats aren't, um, that the goats aren't overgrazing or anything like that. She thinks that they're, they're, they pretty much self-regulate themselves and um, they produce great milk without it and she hasn't had an issue with it. Which, this brings me to my conclusions. Um, luckily for me, there 
is one owner and pretty much all of her ideals um, uh, regulate exactly how the farm is run. So, you know, I've been able to pick her brain and see how she runs her farm and why she does what she does. Um, on the other hand, it um, is extremely complex, especially when you're looking at all these different areas um, of the process. So, um, there's definitely this conflict between the ideals and the reality of the process. And so, going back to this, um, this how, the quality and the art of her cheese, um, she, there's this conflict between the ideal food system that she sees of slow food and local food, and then selling to affluent upscale markets. So all of her cheese, she actually, um, pretty much all of it is exported to um, affluent upscale markets that are um, catered to, um, you know, people who will appreciate her cheese as an art and also would be able to afford it. And so she actually um, doesn't really like to um, try and sell it in a place like Winco because she feels like people wouldn't be able to afford it and they wouldn't be able to appreciate it. Um, so there's also this conflict between the care of the land and then using what the land has to offer. So she, as I said before, she really has um, a really nice sense of place and she really um, understands that the land is important in making the cheese, but she also doesn't really see um, it necessary to try and um, conserve or um, take care of the land in that way. Um, the, the last conflict that I kind of noticed was between managing the herd and the emotional attachment. And so she's, she's some, trying to kind of distinguish between whether the animals are pets, whether they are a commodity, they are her lifestyle. And so actually this last weekend we were um, culling the herd, which means getting rid of the goats that she doesn't find productive anymore and selling them to auction where people buy them for meat. And um, she felt like she was turning her back on her friends because some of these goats she's had for years and years and she just like, she couldn't even be there. We had to, this, the workers had to actually do it without her there. And um, so it's this interesting, um, this interesting dynamic between doing what's financially responsible, um, what's doing, you know, what's most productive, and then, you know, having this emotional attachment to, to the animals. So, as I said before, there are incredible amounts of factors that go into producing even one type of cheese or even one type of food. So, especially when it's something that there's all the steps of production. So, these are exceedingly complex, it, complex but it's really important to understand because, uh, you know, these people that make food are our connection to food and everybody has to eat. So, thanks for listening. <laughs>
learning experience, but I found out that I love it a lot. That I kind of, I kind of love it more than doing schoolwork. So. <laughs> You worked on another farm, cheese farm, that was maybe a little more commercially focused. Yes. Do you have any contrasting sort of observations between the two? Mm -hmm. um, the one that I worked on before was actually in Good Eden. They did cows, and they, they were very um, popular. And so it was extremely different just um, in the entire ideology that was behind it. They were very much um, trying to market to people. And though they, they liked the idea of like local food, it was more for the fact that they wanted to, you know, um, progress themselves rather than like having an environmental and um, people knowing where their food came from. So they had a very interesting, different type of ideal than um, she does. So, okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah.